right? So there, there's an income there and potentially you can start reducing your clients on the implementation space as you increase your clients on the advisory and consulting space. Welcome to your consulting business podcast. My name is Russell Pearson and this is episode number 33. Today we have a, an amazing, an amazing, an amazing guest. And if you have been in the consulting world for any length of time and listened to podcasts, then you will probably know who this guest is, but I'll reveal that shortly. But before I do, I want to talk about getting into consulting because people tend to come to consulting from something else. They don't tend to go from high school straight into a consulting uh, business. Sometimes I'll go through an MBA and they'll go and become an employee as a consultant, but actually run a consulting business is actually quite rare straight out of, say, a high school or a university. What you tend to see is that someone goes and does work somewhere else and they have a realization that the knowledge that they've got and they, the, the, the experience that they've got to share is actually more valuable than the work that they've been doing in the implementation. So there are two areas in particular where I see a lot of this. There's the corporate refugee who wants to leave the corporate space. They're not happy with the machine and they want to really create their own destiny. And if that's you, then you're in the right place. You're going to get a lot of information off these episodes, uh, whether you're watching that on YouTube or whether you're listening to it in your podcasting ears. Uh, but there is this the transition and the, and the difficult transition is going from a place of certainty around uh, income and around the, the opportunities and the clients to work with, all those sort of things are taken care of, <coughs> to actually go out into the wild and potentially, well, you'd need to feed yourself. And that process can become quite scary. So how do you go about doing that? So that's number one. The The other one is the person who's already set up a business of expertise in some sense. So they could be uh, an agency owner. Um, they could be running some sort of um, uh studio, whatever it might be, but they're, they're helping in some area of expertise and they're super smart. They, they, they know this area very, very well. But again, they wake up one day and they realize, actually, I've got a lot of experience and knowledge in this. And every time I'm uh, telling a client or showing a client or, or leading a client on how to do something, I'm actually often giving away that strategy and that advice. And in actual fact, if I start monetizing that, if I start actually putting a price tag or a value on that, I might actually be able to make more money than I can do in my agency. And that was certainly true for me. Uh, I, I did start as an employee, but I left to actually start my own agency. I started a, uh, a marketing and branding agency. And from there, we actually went on to give advice in that space. And once I realized that the advice was eclipsing the actual income that we were getting from the implementation, I'm like, this doesn't add up. I think we need to uh, to move ahead to greener pastures. And that's what I did. So I sold the production side of the business and we actually took the other side, the advisory side of the business and leapt ahead. So there'll be all sorts of ways to get that. Now, with the agency model where you're stepping from that to this new space, you have an income, all right? So there, there's an income there and potentially you can start reducing your clients on the implementation space as you increase your clients on the advisory and consulting space, all right? So that, that's a relatively safe path. But jumping from a corporate role where a lot of people are uh, getting some quite large uh, salaries, you know, we're talking about 250, 350, even higher in some cases, uh, they become these golden handcuffs which keep you caged to the role. And so people who want to step away from that to do something more, it, it can be incredibly scary to go, all right, how am I going to do that uh, without income? How am I going to replace that income? And so the question for you is, do you need to replace that income or have you become addicted to the income, number one? Yes, absolutely. In your uh, consulting business, you can, you can have six and seven figure consulting business. No problem at all. Like these are doable things, but they don't happen overnight. And so how are you going to give yourself the time to do that? And uh, one of the, the pieces we talk about in the interview that's just coming up is taking the time needed to build the relationships to actually build the business that you want in the consulting space. But I'm not going to share that. We'll jump into that in the interview. There's just some things to think about. But let's get into the interview. We're going to jump across to that in just a second. Uh, my next guest is the co-founder and CEO of Consulting Success, which is probably going to give it away anyway, where they specialize uh, in helping entrepreneurial consultants grow profitable, scalable, and strategic consulting businesses. Uh, he's helped over 850 consultants from around the world in over 75 industries add six and seven figures to their annual revenue, 
please make him feel absolutely welcome, Michael Zabersky. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Great to be with you, Russell. Fantastic to have you here. Uh, you are no stranger to the world of consulting. I know that you've been working in, in this space and helping consultants for uh, quite a long time now. Um, I guess the, the way I'd love to start this discussion is really to find out just a little bit about your background, how you how you came to consulting, because usually people tend to come to it from somewhere else. And then um, I'd love to hear about the the path that got you to here. Yeah. So, I mean, this is going back now about 23 uh, years ago. Uh, and I started my first consulting business with my cousin, Sam, uh, our fathers are our twins and we've, we've built, we've sold, uh, we've been involved in multiple businesses together over the years. Uh, so it really has been, you know, family business from, from day one. Yeah. Uh, and the first business was a web design and development company. Um, this was in the early days when most businesses still did not have a website or really had no idea what one would, what, what year was that? Like. Do, you, do you remember what year it was? Oh, I mean, this was, I'd say it was early two thousands. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I don't remember the exact year. I'm, yeah, because I was in a similar space at a similar time, and I think okay. I built my very first website in like '94. Uh, and people were like, "What are these things?" They weren't they weren't yeah. in a professional space. And then uh, I think I probably was three years behind you before launching my web business. So that's that's hilarious. Yeah, there we go. I mean, that, the company at that time was called Fingertip Media. Um, and Sam was really leading up the kind of the design, the, the development work. Uh, mm -hmm. My focus was more on working with clients, marketing, communications. Uh, but really where I got my start, Russell, was just devouring, you know, books and reading and, and studying. Uh, and what I realized pretty quickly as I met more business owners, um, you know, when we were helping them with their websites or just, you know, talking and having conversations was that they were experts in their domain. And so whether that was like running a bagel shop or mm -hmm. uh, a hedge fund or, you know, a law firm, you know, we worked with all kinds of different companies at that in those early stages, um, they didn't have much understanding around marketing. Yeah. Uh, and so as we started to see that, you know, I realized, well, I could probably advise and we could, you know, build some offering around helping them to actually grow their businesses or uh, generate more leads. And so, that led to our, our next consulting business um, where we focus a lot more on marketing and, and also visual identity. Mm -hmm. um, that was called Kanke culture, Kanke being the Japanese word for relationships. So we were always been very focused on the importance of relationships. I ended up going over to Japan and opening up a, a branch office for our company over oh, there. Wow. Yeah. I worked with some very large organizations like Panasonic and Omron and Dow Jones, Japan and financial times and a whole bunch of others helping them to communicate and sell more effectively into English speaking markets. Um, and so that was actually in my early twenties when I was doing that. Go ahead. I, I really, I, I want to stop you because there's so much stuff in there. The, <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the Japanese framework you just de described is, is that, did that have a couple of principles that you can just share? The, the framework? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we, so we built a, oh, well around Kanke culture, you mean the yeah, name yeah, of, yeah. of, well, I mean, we've always just been really focused on, on relationships and especially, mm -hmm. you know, in, um, in an environment or, or or culture, you know, for example, like Japan or in many places throughout Asia, uh, it's you, you don't just go and knock on somebody's door typically and and win business. Uh, you can't yeah. send a piece of direct mail, and especially if you're a foreigner, right? So uh, to get in to to sit at the the boardroom table to meet presidents of companies or um, you know or or executives really requires that you know people, and so. That to us, even before I got to Japan, it's just how we we always operate. We've always operated yeah. with a long term mindset. We look at clients, and we we call our clients clients, not customers. Uh, we don't think transactionally. We think about building a long term relationship. And you know, fast forward to today at Consulting Success, you know, we have some people that um, that have been in our world for like over ten years before they bought anything. And to some people, they look at that as potential failure. Like, you know, your marketing must really suck if it's taking you 10 years to convert somebody on your list to a, a paying buyer. But we look at that and go, well, no, actually, um, I'm proud of, of our team and what we've been doing because we've just been showing up consistently and putting out value. And when people are, are ready and the time is right for them, they'll reach out. And that's happened on so many occasions. I mean, I think 10 years is probably the the record but we've had many people in our world that have been <laughs> been there you know listening to the podcast or reading the books that we put out or whatever it might be for the reason for i wanted to touch time. on that too because the, the relationship side is so important and especially people who are coming into the consulting space um uh they, they tend to be impatient and uh consulting is such a relationship-based business whether it's a if you want to have an advisory 
uh, position in the mind of your client, then you really need to come in at a position of advisory. You can't come in as an employee, which means that you've got to you've got to position yourself in that relationship, you know, and, and become in as the mentor. So the the reason I wanted to highlight that is because um, number one, you've got these experts which you just talked about who've spent 10, 20, even more years getting incredibly good at what they're good at. Mm -hmm. And then they jump into consulting and think they're going to get it overnight. Whereas it's a craft. It's a craft in itself, even the relationship management and um, and and how to deliver uh, whether advice or consultancy. Yeah, I think there's, there's two parts to that, right? I mean, the first is that you can be very good at something, but if nobody knows that you're good at it, and if you haven't uh, demonstrated your expertise, then it's it's really um, you know not going to generate any kind of business for you. So I think mm -hmm. the first step for everybody is if you have expertise, make sure that you are are visible. Make sure that you are uh, developing you know your IP content and you're putting it out there, whether it's in a podcast, a YouTube video, uh, in written form, speaking, whatever it is. You just need to get it get it out there. And the second part brings back to relationships, which is today. You know what we're seeing consistently is that people are hiding behind their monitors. It's very comfortable to you know work on your website or to uh, update your CRM or to play with these LinkedIn automation tools. Mm -hmm. And if you go back in time, I mean, really, what's built the, the most successful businesses in the professional services space? And I'm speaking specifically about that because there's a big distinction between what you see online with marketing and funnels and all the stuff that people are talking about. You know where you see on on ads. Yeah. But to really build a successful professional services business, like the, you know, in the consulting space, uh, it's relationships. And so you need to get not only to be publishing and producing your your IP and content, but you need to make sure that you're getting in front of the right people and then having meaningful conversations with them. And so whether that means you're going to a networking event, to conferences, uh, or you're speaking, or you know, you're joining associations, there's so many different ways. But I think this is a, a real disservice to so many people where they're kind of hiding behind their screens hoping that they don't need to actually interact with people that they can click a button and magically, you know, generate a lead. And um, that's just not the case. Yeah. It, 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 it needs to be a conversation. And um, uh, I'm, I'm sure because you've been in uh, the, the online marketing space and all, all that in the, in the past that you, you get that there's different buying processes for different, uh, different business models. Sure. And what is the point of sale? Well, in a consultancy, the point of sale is the conversation. And so if right. you're not willing to have the conversation, <laughs> you're not willing to have the client. Yeah. I mean, it's the same with, so people who are, and I, I speak as somebody who uh, felt this way early on, uh, I didn't like going on camera. I didn't want to, you know, be at the, the front of the stage. Um, but if you think about, you know, from that mindset, mm -hmm. all you're really doing is delaying the inevitable, which is that at some point you're going to be in front of a client. So, you know, you have expertise. Uh, you, your job is to make sure that other people know that you have that expertise and to demonstrate that expertise. So whether it's on video or whether it's on podcast and audio or written form, it's so critical that you get out there. You know, you need to kind of shout from the rooftops and let people know that you exist. Otherwise, no, nobody's going to do it for you. And, you know, to your point, Russell, you're going to have a conversation at some point with a client because nobody buys consulting services. You know, they don't just write a check for $50,000 or, you know, $500,000 without having at least one conversation, if not multiple mm -hmm. conversations. It's not just clicking a button, buying a course or buying, you know, a, a cell phone um, where you don't necessarily need to have that, that deeper conversation. But in this business, it all is about conversation. And so marketing, content creation, how you approach sales should always be re reverse engineered to ask yourself, what is the most direct path that I can take right now to have a conversation with a real buyer? Love it. That's exactly right. So you, you you're building the 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 I think the second consultancy. You've opened up a a, 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 um, a location in 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 Japan. Japan, yeah, uh, yeah. Where to then? Uh, so we did that for for several years. Uh, then I decided, um, both my wife and I, before we had kids, that we wanted to move back to North America. So we came back uh, to Vancouver. Uh, and at that time, Sam and I went in, in different directions, uh, very just, we wanted to do our kind of our own thing. So it wasn't, uh, any kind of the issue. The band broke up. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it wasn't really a, a breakup. It was more just, I came back and it was funny because at that time, Sam was actually going to Japan. And so we had a bit of a crossover. So he was in Japan and then I came, um, back to North America and I created a, or started another, uh, consulting business this time focusing on. Uh, lead generation, and it was called Relogy Marketing, uh, Re Relogy standing for Relationship Strategy. So you can see this oh, nice. theme of relationships, <laughs> yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's always in there. Um, but yeah, so that was just really doing a lot of lead generation for other professional services companies, um, law firms, other consultancies, um, 
insurance companies, investment companies, uh, and did that for a period of time. Uh, but one family barbecue one summer, Sam and I were sitting outside together going, you know what, um, we should really do something again together, but this time we should do it online uh, because all of our businesses at that point, you know, they weren't really online businesses. They, they were to a degree, but it wasn't a full online business. Mm -hmm. And so we thought about, you know, where do we really have the most experience? We've been, you know, 10 years into building different consulting businesses. What if we just start sharing our experiences of, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, of like the stories from the trenches. What is it actually really like to build a consulting business? You know, what happens when you get punched in the stomach and what are the, the mistakes that we've made? And hopefully we can help people to accelerate their success and to avoid, um, you know, all the issues that, that we've encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we just started sharing freely. There was no, no product, no monetization. We just put it up on consultingsuccess.com of here's what we've been through. We just published a lot of articles uh, and then fast forward, um, you know, into that journey, we had more and more people coming to the website saying, this is great. Do you guys have a course on how to become a successful consultant? And at that point we didn't. So we said, well, we'll create one. Um, and then people went through that course and said, we're getting, you know, a lot of good results. Is there a way to work more closely with you guys? And we said, no, but we'll create a coaching program. And so we did. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, here we are today, we've had um, several thousand people go through our, our programs and our workshops. Um, we have a program that's for early stage consultants called Momentum. We have uh, our Clarity Coaching Program that is for consultants that uh, really want to accelerate, you know, to high six and and well into seven figures. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're doing, you know, day in day out with a, a great team today. I think there's a really important point that you made there, and and it wasn't necessarily a point I heard it, but I don't know if the audience did. The um, uh, people started asking you for something. Yeah, and I know a lot of uh, certainly startup businesses that have never run a business before. And I know I know that's not the audience we're necessarily talking to, but they tend to go, "All right, well, um, they believe they build it and they will come." Um, philosophy. They go, "There's a need." You know, they've been told that there's a need in the world that they need to fix sure. or something. They spend yeah. two years developing a product and then they take it out to a silent audience, uh, and so they you know, spend two years trying to find a market for it. But uh, what I what I love about that is that you were talking to the market. All right, you were talking to the market and listening to the market and they told you what they wanted yes but so, but this only came because we had made the exact mistake that you're talking about uh previously so we had another business uh you know go going back a few years where we did you know made the exact mistake that you just talked about where we we built and we hired a, a company to develop uh, a whole kind of software platform yeah. uh and, you know, invested in what today's dollars would probably be $50,000 into it. Mm -hmm. And then we launched it. Uh, and we found out that as we had people starting to use the product, that they really only cared about 10% of it, uh, you know, of the features and everything we put in. I mean, luckily, we were able to transition that um, and get it back on track and ultimately sell that business. And so it worked out well. But we learned that that lesson that uh, you really want to get validation and feedback from the marketplace as early on as possible. And so subsequent to that, every time that we launch a new program, an idea, uh, you know, we're often kind of selling that before we even build it uh, yeah. with the idea of, are there people out there that are interested? And there's so many ways that you can achieve this validation. There's lots of great, you know, books and resources that can really take you through that, that path of how to do it effectively. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's something that we practice and that we really recommend to clients, uh, especially those that are kind of going down the path of productizing their service offerings is to kind yes. of do that step and stage of, of validation before you spend the time creating all the videos and building things and putting the LMS together and the trainings. And, you know, it, people have just seen that so often where if they go that path of building everything out and then they try and sell it and they realize that nobody wants to buy it. I mean, they've wasted not only time, but, uh, but money and, and resources. And if they have a team, they've divert their team's attention to something that now everybody is feeling, you know, pretty bad about. So um, yeah. that validation stage is definitely critical. I, um, I'm a, a geek for nuance, right? Um, practical nuance, the, like the how we did the specific thing actually made a big difference to how it was sure. successful. Um, do you have a particular way that you go to a market to get feedback or, or go to a market to hear what they're, what they're really looking for? Yeah, so this has changed over time. And I mean, what I'm happy to kind of talk through is a few different ways because it'll depend on somebody's situation, right? So if you have, uh, let's say, a, a community already that you can tap into. I mean, that's that's going to be the best place to go. If yeah. you don't have that, then you're going to take a bit of a different approach. So let's just say that for somebody right now, they don't have a, an email list, they don't have a community that they can tap into, mm -hmm. uh, then you're going you're gonna to have to hustle a little bit. You know, you're going to have to try and do some things on, on social media, let's say like LinkedIn, uh, or reach out to people and, and try and have some conversations. Another approach is to find somebody that already has access to that audience and try and broker a, a deal with them to say, hey, we we're thinking about developing this. Uh, you have this audience. 
you know, let's launch it to the idea, the concept to your audience. And then anybody, everybody that buys will share the revenue on it. So that yeah. that's one way that you can kind of leverage that. But I think for, you know, a lot of people, if you've already been in business for a period of time, you're going to have an email list or a database. Uh, and you probably have a whole bunch of connections on, on LinkedIn or a platform similar to that, or maybe you've created some kind of a community. Mm -hmm. And so for us, what we've typically done is, you know, we'll just simply send a couple of emails. I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, several years back, we were running a client mastermind uh, event for some of our clients in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and I was sitting down with one of our great clients and friends named Elliot. Uh, and I had just finished taking everybody through a session on how to productize consulting services. And he said, Michael, we were just about to go for lunch. He said, Michael, that, like, that was great. Have you ever thought about actually creating like a course on how to productize consulting services? So just like taking what you just share with us, yeah. but actually go into more depth and create a program around that. I said, hmm, like, no, that's a really interesting idea, but I, I love it. Um, and so what I did is right after lunch, I sent one email to our email database and said, here's what I'm thinking about doing, everyone. Uh, it, you know, if you'd be interested in this, hit reply and I'll share some more details with you. And so by the end of that day, we had a, you know, a good number of people that said, yeah, I'd be very interested in that. Uh, and by the next morning, I'd already sent an email back with a payment link to all those people. And I just said very candidly, great, like you're, you're, you've got a spot. Here's what it costs. I think at that point it was like $750. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, it'll, it'll be ready in within six weeks or eight weeks or whatever the time kind of span was. I was giving myself time to actually then go and build it and to talk to the yeah. team and get everything organized. But you know, it already had generated enough uh, validation that it wasn't just one person or myself thinking that it'd be a great idea. Um, we actually had people that had taken out their credit card, paid for it, uh, and we knew that if we got a, a segment or a, you know a percentage of people paying right away, we'd be able to get a lot more. And so, you know, that went on to to be something that we've built a lot around. Oh, that's fantastic! So you start developing all these uh, uh, yeah uh, opportunities. Some of them work better than others. Uh, you're really starting to now help people build their consulting uh, practice. Do you look at it as a business or a practice? No, it's it's a business. I mean, so we we refer to those that, that we really um, serve and support as entrepreneurial consultants. Yeah. Uh, and the distinction there is that oftentimes people will say, I'm, I'm a consultant. And you look at their business and they're, they're really working maybe with one or two clients or they're getting all of their business from some other agency or some other firm. And so they mm -hmm. don't really have a business because no. they don't own, quote, kind of quote, own that relationship. And so yeah. if that spigot gets, gets kind of turned, you know, that tap is turned off, all of a sudden they, they don't have a business or that one client or two clients go away. I mean, they're, they're kind of out of the water. Uh, and so our focus with all of our clients is really helping them to, to be more entrepreneurial or to establish the systems and the processes so that they have something that not only allows them to scale, but something that is profitable and something that is really sustainable for them. Mm. Uh, and we're also very focused on, on the lifestyle that it's not just about building a business and making more money, but it's building a business that supports the lifestyle that you want to have um, so that you're feeling really great about it. You're fulfilled and it's something that you want to do long term. Yeah, the um, yeah, the word sustainability is such uh, an important one. A lot of people just attribute it to environment, but it it is really in your ability to 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 put energy out into the world. And I think that that's an amazing focus to help people with that. Um, yeah. We are like um, we are literally just scraping a little flake off the top of of the stuff that we could talk about, it, Michael. Um, yeah. I'd love to invite you back at some point. Um, yeah, happy to. Yeah, where can people find out more about you and these programs? Uh, so home base for everything is consultingsuccess.com. Um, I mean, there's the podcast. You'll see videos. We have what a thousand articles on the website now. Um, we we run studies uh, where we ask tens of thousands of consultants about things like fees and marketing and their lifestyle. Uh, so you can find all that there. Uh, you can also get we have a free guide on how to add six figures to your consulting business uh, as a blueprint and that's all free. Uh, so yeah, consultingsuccess.com would be the, the best place to go. And the free guides actually, it's on the front of the website or it's, it's going to be easy to it find. Is, it is, yeah. I mean, I, I can give you a longer URL to go to a specific page, but I, I think people can just um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we'll, easily find it. And yeah, We'll put the URL for the website in the, in the show notes as well. So whether you're watching this on YouTube or whether you're actually listening to it on the podcast, you'll be able to actually get access to it um michael thank you very much for uh speaking with me i really appreciate it my pleasure russell thanks so, uh, so much for having me and hope to have you back again at another date my pleasure bye for now 
Wasn't that an awesome interview? Like, again, and again, we, we just touched the surface. There is so much more we can talk about, but we're trying to keep these episodes condensed because in past uh, in past podcasts, I've gone out to like an hour and a half in some of these episodes and they can get huge. Now, that being said, I'd love to, you to tell me how long would you like these things to go? This is all flexible. We have control. We can actually change things on the fly. How would you like these podcasts to evolve? Let me know in the comments or by sending me uh, an email at russellpearson.com. Now, the, uh, what I love about uh, Michael Zipersky's story is that it's a real story. Like, th- this, is the, this is the nature of a consulting business. We are, we are doing a number of things, and we emerge as a consulting business when we actually find uh, where those expertise lie. And, and being very aware of listening to the market that hopefully we're bringing into us and having those relationships so that we can actually say, uh, what do you want? rather than trying to identify a problem to fix, uh, which again can be a, a tragedy for, for many entrepreneurs. Now, uh, book review. We're always going to do a book review or a helpful app or whatever it might be. I'm thinking um, today I'm going to do uh, another book review. This one's about team building. And I know uh, Michael's in the, the process of actually building out his team of co- uh, coaches and consultants. And um, this book is something that uh, I really gravitated to when I was building my own team in the agency. And um, it's The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. (coughs) Patrick Lencioni uh, has some fantastic fable-based books, and uh, this is another great one. Um, It it, it tells the story of a person who has been in a consulting role. They've... uh, They've been in a management role as well, and they, they retire and move away to a, a small little town, but they, uh, they can't rest on their laurels. They have to do something, and so they go and become a, a manager of, a, of a, a local store, and it tells the story about how they go about the process of uh, uh, building and improving that team, and so there are lessons that are given in that fable style. Uh, and uh, for me, it really uh, all those fable style books really hit home. So uh, we've got a link below in the show notes if you want to go grab that book. But this one, the five dysfunctions of a team, is one that really had an impact on me. Now, if you are a consultant and you're watching this, if you're not a consultant and watching this, you've just got a real curiosity uh, with consultants. What is wrong with you? But if you are a consultant or thinking about becoming a consultant, you want to be part of a community that has consultants in it. So you can talk about things that consultants talk about, right? Uh, It's a peer group discussion. And the opportunity to have that is over at Future Proof Business Group, which is on Facebook. I know it's on Facebook. People go, why do you put it on Facebook? Well, because Facebook conversations happen on a daily basis. LinkedIn conversations tend to happen on a weekly basis. And I like having conversations a lot faster. So go to Facebook. If you are interested in joining the group, go to Future Proof Business Group. Uh, apply there. We'll let you in if you're a consultant or uh, running a service advisory business. Uh, we would love to have you as part of that community. I think there's about 1,400 amazing consultants, uh, especially from Australia, but also around the world. And I invite you to become part of that. Um, now, if you are looking for more episodes like this, obviously subscribe. So subscribe either to the podcast where you downloaded this or subscribe to YouTube. Uh, We're looking forward to bringing more of these episodes out on a weekly basis. And by the way, if you are listening to this in the audio version uh, on a podcast streaming platform of your choice, there is also a episode of Tactical Tuesday that we put out each week. Tactical Tuesday is a little bite-sized tactic that you can take and implement in your business uh, these little short snippets that you can actually get. And we, we publish them live in the Future Proof Business Group. Uh, but then we also publish most of them, not all of them, but most of them on the YouTube channel as well. So you might want to look for Tactical Tuesday uh, and Russell Pearson too. And Russell Pearson spelled double S, double L, the way Russell should be spelled. Till next time, stay passionate and I will see you on the next episode. Bye for now.